Hi, Jesse. Okay, folks. So, I don't know if you guys, any of you go back and watch the videos, but for some reason, the Wednesday lectures, it takes forever to upload them. And then the Monday ones, it's like, boop! I don't know why. This is my theory, is that the YouTubers like to upload everything on Wednesdays or something like that. I don't know what that is. Did anyone notice that? It was like, there was the Monday lecture, and it took me a week to get that Wednesday one up. I had to like re-upload it like three times, and it would get stuck. And if you guys read some of the emails, I was like, we're stuck at 66%, we're stuck at it. What, did anyone laugh at that? Okay, good. Just like, sorry folks, but trying my best here. Okay, um, so we were talking about carboxylic acids. And remember, carboxylic acids, you have an R group, and then you have a carbonyl group, which is your carbon double bond oxygen. And then on the other side, you have a uh, carbon oxygen single bond, and that's why it's the H, so the COH. There's our carboxylic acids. And up here, we have an aldehyde and an acetone. Those are the two things that we had in the previous chapter. And we've got them up there just for reference, so you folks can see that around the carbonyl carbon, We've got a trigonal planar geometry, and trigonal planar usually has bond angles of 120, 120, and 120, but that's in a perfect world. So it's gonna depend on what your groups are over here and how big they are and how much they're gonna squish that bond angle. So that's why it put those angles in right there, but you can see about 120-ish all the way around. Do we not remember the geometry from 2A? Kind of sort of a little bit. We have like linear and trigonal planar and tetrahedral. Is that just at least ringing a bell, folks? And bond angles, uh, the 109.5, 107, 104.5 for the tetrahedral. Yes, that's the geometry of the molecule. And we had 120 um, for trigonal planar and 180 for linear. Are we remembering that? A couple people, good, okay, all right. So um, yeah, um, following the same pattern there. Now the difference between the oxygens and our carboxylic acids, the oxygen up there is called the carbonyl oxygen because it's part of the carbonyl group, which is the carbon double bond oxygen. So the carbonyl oxygen, and this one over here actually has a different name. So we can reference them and know that we need a different oxygen and that's called the carboxylate oxygen right here. The carboxylate oxygen and the carbonyl oxygen. Or if you can't remember the carboxylate oxygen, the carbonyl oxygen and the other oxygen, which is usually how my brain works because Sometimes it glitches and I can't remember that the other one's called the carboxylate oxygen. Even though I've been doing chemistry since Jesus did chemistry. And um, yeah, so there you go. Okay, folks? All right. So moving on to the next slide. So um, our carboxylic acids are polar because they have the oxygen in them. Is that okay with everybody? Uh-oh, I forgot my glasses. No, I didn't. Oh, hurrah. I was like, oh, I'm gonna have to be like, big, small, big, small, and annoy you guys by adjusting my screen, but now I won't, so I got my glasses. The joys of getting old. Here we go. Does anyone make fun of their parents for doing this? No. I used to, and now I have to do that. <laughs> my kids make fun of me. Okay, so in our carboxylic acids, we've got oxygens. And not only do we have oxygens, but we have an oxygen that has a hydrogen on it. So what we can do is we can hydrogen bond. Uh, so remember with a hydrogen bond, we need in one molecule an electronegative atom. And that's represented by the oxygen right here. So we've got the electronegative atom in this molecule right here that can be a proton acceptor is how we phrase it in chemistry and that annoys the crap out of students because they want this called the hydrogen 
Okay. So, and the acceptor means that it doesn't itself have the hydrogen. It is accepting the attraction or it is accepting the hydrogen from the other molecule, even though it doesn't steal it, it's just attracted. So anyways, an electronegative atom on one molecule and a hydrogen on another molecule, and it can't just be any hydrogen. It has to be a hydrogen that's bonded to a very electronegative atom here, okay? So do we remember those rules, folks? Okay, so we're doing a hydrogen bond, and with the carboxylic acid, not only are we doing a hydrogen bond in one place, but we can do a hydrogen bond in a second place. So if you get two carboxylic acids together, they can arrange themselves so that they're hydrogen bonding in two places, which does a lot to keep them together, which means that they're more likely to be a liquid at room temperature than a gas because they have some kind of force keeping them together. And remember in liquids, our molecules are very close. Does that make sense, folks? Okay, so if you've got two points of interaction that where you're staying together, it's gonna to take a lot of energy to get that apart, which means you're going to have to put a lot of energy into the system, which translates to a higher temperature to get them apart into the gas space. Okie dokie, Smokies. So when you have two points of interaction like that with your hydrogen bond, um, we say that it's called a dimer. Di meaning what, folks? Two, okay? Now look at the boiling points down here of molecules that are pretty much the same size. And we have isobutylene over here that only has carbon hydrogen bonds. And so there's no polarity there. So the only thing sticking isobutylenes together is what? Van der Waals forces or dispersion forces or London forces, whatever we wanna call them. You guys remember that? where you have like this instantaneous dipole sometimes. So these don't really stay together a whole lot. So you don't have to put a whole lot of heat in them to get them apart. So this is gonna turn into a gas at minus 6.9 degrees Celsius. So there's not a whole lot of keeping it together. And then we have acetone and acetone has an oxygen in it. So we have a little bit of polarity there. So you can get dipole-dipole bonding between acetone molecules, but you don't get hydrogen bonding because your acetones don't have a hydrogen that's on an electronegative atom. So you don't have something that's providing the hydrogen for the hydrogen bond. And these hydrogens down here that are on the carbons, they're not participating in hydrogen bonding because they're bonded to carbon, which is not an electronegative atom. So we have uh, dipole dipole bonding there and you can see that the boiling point goes up substantially so they st it sticks together quite a bit um, which means that acetone tends to be a liquid at room temperature but you guys know that with acetone which is what we use to take fingernail polish off you smell it right away right folks which means that that liquid has a propensity to jump up into the vapor phase, which is what is going into your nose and what is causing your brain to go, whoa, I smell that. Does that make sense? So still they, these acetone molecules aren't held together super strongly. And then we move on to isopropyl alcohol and acetic acid. And can you see how we've got that increase in the boiling point there? So isopropyl alcohol. Do we have a hydrogen on the alcohol molecule that can do hydrogen bonding? Yes. Look down here at these hydrogens that are bonded to the carbons there in this one. Are those our hydrogens that are doing hydrogen bonding? No, because you need a hydrogen that's bonded to a very electronegative atom. Where is that hydrogen in isopropyl alcohol? That one right there, that's our special hydrogen. It's bonded to a very electronegative atom there. That's the one that's gonna be doing the hydrogen bonding. So we have hydrogen bonding taking uh, place in this alcohol right there. So those molecules are being held together pretty tightly. So you would expect isopropyl alcohol to be a liquid at room temperature. Does this make sense, folks? Yes, no, maybe so? Okay. Um, 
Then we move on to acetic acid and we notice that the boiling point is even higher. So what's going on here that's making the boiling point even higher than that of alcohol, even though isopropyl alcohol has hydrogen bonding? What happened? Okay, so what you're saying is what's going on up there? Like yes. one is one way and the other one is the other way. And then someone back here said what? You can scream it at me. Oh. They have, um, what's that? Okay, so we have an oxygen here and an oxygen here that has a hydrogen on it. Did I hear that right? Yes. Yes, so you both are on the right path. You've got two highly electronegative atoms here. So that's telling us, okay, right away we got dipoles happening, right? So you can have dipole-dipole bonding. Is that okay for us folks? Yes. So we've already got that going on. And then the question is, do we have special and stronger dipole-dipole bonding, which is hydrogen bonding? And do we have a hydrogen in this molecule here that will do hydrogen bonding. A hydrogen that's bonded to a very electronegative atom. Yes, which one is it? The CH3 hydrogen or the OH hydrogen? Yes, this hydrogen is bonded to a very electronegative atom, so this is the one that's gonna be doing the hydrogen bonding. Also, as um, I think both of you were trying to get to, we can do the dimer thing, where we have two points of hydrogen bonding. So if you have two points of hydrogen bonding, does it make sense that the acetic acid is going to have quite a high boiling point, folks? It's gonna take a lot of energy to get those apart and make it go from liquid to vapor phase, which translates into a lot of heat putting into the system to get it to do that. Are we making sense here? Okay, all right. Now, why do we need a hydrogen to be bonded to a very electronegative atom? This slide is a whole lot of uh, review for hydrogen bonding, and you didn't know we were gonna do that today, right folks? No answer, okay, all right. Well, this hydrogen right here, if it's bonded to a very electronegative atom, what happens is a very electronegative atom uh, says, come here, to, the electrons that they're sharing is like, and it sucks them this way. So the hydrogen right there is already partially positive because it's a polar bond. But if this one is very electronegative and it's pulling the electrons towards it even more, that makes this hydrogen even more partially positive, which makes it even more attractive to this electronegative atom over here. So this interaction is stronger. Does that make sense? How just that little bit of change in the pull on the electron causes um, such a difference? You guys look really excited about this topic. Okay, all right. So I just nerded it out on you, but hopefully that was a little bit of a review on hydrogen bonding that made it a little bit more clear about like why it's affecting things so much. Okay, questions for me? Yes, sir. So all of these are true based on the on the following one of them, right? For them to shift and rotate the rocket, they have to have a solid boiling point. In order to shift and what, what, what? Rotate the molecules, like the hydrogens, shift into other elements to connect the bond. They, uh, they need to have hydrogen bonding? No, it's for the hydrogens to rotate, to attach to another hydrogen. Did they have to be triggered by a boiling point? I don't quite understand the question. I'll tell you later. Okay, okay, no problem. Okay, so the, the um, point of this slide is our carboxylic acids are going to have pretty high boiling points, and that's because of the hydrogen bonding, and not only the hydrogen bonding, but the two points of hydrogen bonding, which causes dimers. Um, this also means that our carboxylic acids tend to be water soluble because they are polar. They've got two very electronegative atoms, which makes two points of polarity there. Um, and water is polar, and water, like
lots of other polar things because polar things dissolve other polar things, like dissolves like. The um, problem comes when your R group right here gets very large. So if you get a really large R group or a big hydrophobic tail, you start to become more and more insoluble in water because your non-polar portion of your molecule starts to dwarf your polar portion. And we'll see that in a little bit. Okay, carboxylic acids are acids, which means they release what? Hydrogen. That's what we learned in 2A, right? That uh, acids are things that give up hydrogens, right folks? Okay, and they sure do. But they don't just give up any hydrogen, they give up the hydrogen that's on the oxygen right there. The hydrogens that are bonded to the carbons, those ones are stuck to the carbons. Carbons don't give up their hydrogens. They're like, you're mine, no, okay? But the oxygen's like, okay, that's all right. And it can do this because once it releases the hydrogen right there, we have an anion that can do a resonance structure. Um, so what you'll see sometimes drawn is something like this, where this oxygen that's right here, it's like, ooh, I have this negative charge, and I kind of like negativity, but I don't want to do it all the time. And so I want to be happy, and I want to have uh, two bonding pairs and two lone pairs. And this one up here has two bonding pairs and two lone pairs. So lone pairs you don't see drawn in up there, but you see them drawn in here. And this oxygen right here is like, you know what? You need to share this negative charge. So it flips these electrons now to make the double bond and the carbon right there is like, whoa, I only need an octet. So something has to give here and this half of the double bond flips up here. So these two electrons jump up here to become a third lone pair right there. And the negative symbol moves this way. You can see it right there. And we can imagine that it flips back and forth all day long like that. The truth is it's somewhere in between that, but that's our best representation that we can get. And because this negative charge can be distributed over two atoms like that, the ion, the carboxylate ion, is pretty stable. And if you have something that's pretty stable, um, life tends to create that, okay? So the hydrogen is allowed to jump off and you can see that the pink hydrogen on the top left up there is jumping off onto the water, onto the H2O, bloop, and that makes H3O plus, which is called hydronium. And if you didn't learn this or you just weren't paying attention in 2A because it was one of the last chapters that you did, um, this is what hydronium looks like. The oxygen only has a single lone pair and it has three single bonds. Oxygen doesn't like to exist like that very much and when things aren't doing what they optimally like to do, they tend to have a charge, negative or positive. So, um, yeah, that's what hydronium looks like. Now, remember the water looks like that, or if we wanted to draw it with the bent angle, we'd see it like that. So the hydrogen is hopping onto the water to make a hydronium. Are we okay with this, folks? Yes. <laughs> That's a very definite yes, very not. Okay, um, questions for me? Concerns? Complaints? No? Okay, so why did I show you guys carboxylate ion? Well, part of it we saw last week in lab when we made soaps, because soaps are actually salts. And when we think of salt, we think of sodium chloride, which is the stuff we put on our food and it makes everything taste better. But that is just one kind of salt. So a salt is going to have a cation and an anion. So sodium chloride, we write it like that normally without the charges. 
but we assume that you know that it is the sodium ion and the chloride ion, so the cation and the anion together, okay? Um, does everyone remember that okay? Okay, all right, so with our soaps, we're also going to have a salt, except for the anion, the negatively charged thing, is going to be very large, and the R group portion of it is what's really large, okay? But again, what is the carboxylate? Well, the carboxylate oxygen is that oxygen right there, and if it's an ion or an anion, it looks like that. So if we pull the hydrogen off of our carboxylic acid, what we're going to do is create a negative charge on that oxygen. And the negative charge makes it more soluble in water because the water is like, oh, something that is negatively charged and we like polar or ionic things. And so we're going to surround it. And when it does that, it's dissolving it. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, we go, okay, a carboxylic acid is an acid. We know that from the name, right folks? And we know that this hydrogen is gonna jump off because it's an acid and we just learned that in the last slide, right? So if we react it with a base, what's gonna happen? When you put an acid and a base together. Yes, you're gonna get water and a salt. You guys kinda sorta remember hearing that? Okay, so it's neutralized. So we throw sodium hydroxide in there, and remember, things that have hydroxides on them tend to be bases, like sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. Does this sound familiar? Yes. Okay, and then you guys will learn about the pH scale and all that good stuff. All right, so the hydroxide, the OH minus, is gonna get together with the H plus, and it's gonna make what? Water? Yes! And if we write H2O a different way, it makes it a little more clear what this is. So we have HOH there, okay? So the color coding isn't that fabulous on that one. But anyways, we get a salt and water. Now notice with our salt that it's drawn funky. So, in organic chemistry, we're like, we know that you learned that you're supposed to put the cation first and then the anion, like in sodium chloride. That's just how we do it, and that's how we name it. And also, how you write it is that you don't put the charges in. Do you guys remember learning all that? And then organic chemists come along and they say, ha, 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 we like to be different. We're going to write the anion first. So there's the anions, so that would be equivalent to writing Cl first. And then we're going to write the cation second, so that would be like writing Cl minus um, Na plus, okay? And also, we're gonna leave the charges there. Ha 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 ha. So, do you folks see that? The weird thing about this is that the anion portion is this huge clunky thing, whereas we're used to an anion looking lovely and small, compact, like Cl minus. Okie dokie, Smokies? Okay, but that is a salt, just like sodium chloride. We just see the anion written first because that's the product of interest. The sodium ion, the sodium cation isn't doing a whole lot, it's kind of sitting there. It's a little bit, it's attracted to the O minus and that's why we draw it in. Sometimes you won't even see it there because chemists are like, I'm not interested in that, so I'm just gonna draw the anion. And students are like, where did the sodium go? Ha! Ah! Because we tell you, make sure you keep track of every atom and make a chart on each side to make sure every atom is accounted for. You guys remember that? Yes, and organic chemists come along and go, oh, okay, all right, anyways. Um, yeah, so I know it's frustrating for you folks. Okay, so how do we name these salts? So you folks already learned how to name salts in uh, 2A, like sodium chloride. And it works the same way with these organic salts. Yay, something that works the same way and follows the rules, right folks? So 
we're going to name the cation first, even though we drew it with the cation coming second. So if we take a look at the um, molecules, the salts down at the bottom, the compounds at the bottom, you can see that we've drawn the sodium to the right. And we've named it how we regularly name it with the cation coming first. So we've got sodium there. And then if you imagine that this big old anion was something like a chlorine with a minus, you would just go ahead and say sodium chloride. But it's going to freak you out because it's big and you think you don't know what this thing is. But you do because we learned about common nomenclature. And when you've got two carbons there in common nomenclature, you tend to see the prefix ST, like acetone or acetic acid. Okay. Now, um, this ending here, when it's an anion, is acetate. Now, the one to the right of it, you can see that the cation is potassium. So we just go ahead and say that first. Is everybody okay with that? Potassium. And the anion is benzoate. And where did I get that from? Probably from benzoic acid. looks like that first. And don't freak out, you'll probably have a chart in front of you so you can recognize these things. Okie dokie, Smokies? Okay, so the salts are more soluble in water than just the regular carboxylic acids are. So it makes it useful. Any questions here? Anyone still writing? You need to pause for a second. Okay. All right. And here's where they're really useful. So it gives us something to make in lab, and it gives us something to do after we've gone to the bathroom, right? Wash our hands. Okay, so soaps. We don't generally think of soaps and salts in the same place, um, but soaps are salts. Um, you can see right here that you've got a, a cation, and then you can see right here that you've got an anion. It just happens to have this big old long tail right there. So if you've got your cat, excuse me, you've got a cation and an anion, and you've got a salt. Ah, so what we do is we take the carboxylic acid that has a really long R chain. So you have 10 or more carbons here, all the way. And you treat it with a strong base. And why do you treat it with a strong base is because you want to rip that hydrogen off of right there and make it this anion. Because the anion is more what? Soluble in water. Soluble in water. Yes. And if you have this big old long chain right here that's insoluble in water, you need some portion that's soluble in water because you need to wash your hands with what? Water, okay? So yes, that, that is the point here. Okay, so we usually make our soaps by treating vegetable oils or animal fats with a strong base, either sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. Does anyone make soap at home? You do? Is it fun? No, that's just a long procedure. Do you make fun little shapes like Star Wars, like TIE Fighters and stuff? Just make regular more. Just right? Oh, okay. All right, all right. I don't know if I have those. I make cupcakes, though. He makes cupcakes, though? Yeah. That's super, That's super cool. I like that. Okay, so if we use potassium hydroxide, that's going to give us a soft soap. And if we use sodium hydroxide, that's going to give us hard soap. Okay, so you can use either base depending on what you want. Um, potassium, concentrated potassium hydroxide, we use a whole lot in our house. So if you want to clean your oven and you buy some oven cleaner and spray it all on the inside, I mean, who does that these days? We just keep on cooking off the crusties, right? Um, but anyways, if you want to do that, make sure you put on gloves because the 
potassium hydroxide is super concentrated. And concentrated base will uh, burn your skin just like concentrated acid will. Um, so we use potassium hydroxide for that. We also use concentrated potassium hydroxide to clean our drains. So if you look on the back of the liquid plumber or Drano or that special stuff you buy at Home Depot that they market it with a bag around it and all that, have you seen that stuff, you guys? Yeah. It's potassium hydroxide. So you probably should be wearing gloves and goggles while you're trying to get that hairball that's as big as a rabbit out of your drain. Right, folks? Yes. If you have hair, or if you have sisters or moms or whatever with hair. I have a daughter with long hair, so I'm constantly pulling out these big hair balls. And she's like, that's so gross. I'm like, it's your hair, honey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, so an example of this, we've got sodium stearate right there. And this uh, reaction um, is called saponification. When we take a carboxylic acid and we strip the hydrogen off of it to make it a carboxylate anion. And that's gonna pair with the cation that's available, whether that's a sodium ion or a potassium ion. It could be either way. Now, um, why this works is because we can form these little things called micelles. So right here, you've got the nonpolar region or we can say this is the nonpolar tail part of it. And those are the tails that are right here. And the nonpolar parts, they'll face in and they'll surround something oily. So if we're talking about soaps and cleaning, it's gonna surround a grease ball or oil, which oftentimes is where our dirt is also. And it's going to point the polar portion let me do that in green right here so it's corresponding. So this is polar. That's those polar heads right there. So that's going to point that out towards the water. And water is what? Polar or nonpolar? Polar. Your water is polar. So the polar portion of the soap is going to point itself out towards the water because polar likes polar. And then when you wash this away, the little micelles, and we spell it out like that, go down the drain. So are we okay with what's happening when um, we use soap, folks? Kind of, sort of, maybe? Okay, so when you're washing your hand, um, your hands, often that little grease ball that is shown in the middle right there is the oils from your skin. That's why after we wash our hands, we're like, ooh, they're all dry and we have to put lotion on because it's like grabbing our skin oil. Okay, so that's what happens. It happens on your head too when you wash your hair with shampoo. It's grabbing your hair oils and then our hair is all dry and then we have to add moisturizer back in. We're like, ah, it's all crusty and I have split ends, right? Okay, questions for me on this? You guys did this in the lab. You made soap. We should take it further and make little, like, shaped soaps. You guys can take those home. Give them to mom for Christmas or something. Be like, look what I made at school, right? Okay, so how do we make carboxylic acids? Well, you guys already learned this. Because we did the alcohol chapter. And right here we've got the primary alcohol. And remember with the primary alcohol, you have an OH that is bonded to what kind of carbon? Primary. A primary carbon. Primary carbon there. And then we have some kind of oxidizing agent. And right here, seeing the oxidation is happening or you're using an oxidizing agent so we have sodium or potassium dichromate which we did in lab so remember the um, orange turns green if you guys remember that we had dichromate there and it was oxidizing primary and secondary alcohols but it did not oxidize the tertiary alcohol is that kind of sort of in your all folks okay so you did this and you went from primary alcohol to carboxylic acid, 
and that would have turned your test tube from orange to green. Because when we did that reaction, we also had the production of chromium-3, which gave us the uh, green color. So this oxidizing, this oxidation happened, and then we had a reduction also that happened with it. We did not stop at the aldehyde because we did not use which oxidizing agent? PCC, yes, exactly. Okay, so that's how we make our carboxylic acids. So the bottom says, how would you prepare a butanoic acid uh, using two different methods? That means you have to figure out what butanoic acid is, folks. Okay, we are in the carboxylic acid portion of this chapter. So butanoic acid is probably a what? Probably a carboxylic acid. And also we're in the synthesis of carboxylic acids part, right? The title is on the top of this slide. So probably we're making a carboxylic acid. Also, if it has oic acid on the end, it's probably a what? It's probably a carboxylic acid. Okay, so a carboxylic acid is going to have a carbonyl group and then an OH on the end, right folks? Does that make sense? Okay, in that name, butanoic acid, you have butan, which tells us that you have how many carbons? Four. Okay, are we seeing how to break down um, our problems into little pieces so that we can do them? Are we okay? Okay, good. So I go ahead and go two, three, four. And probably on the end, I've got CH3, and that's CH2, and this one is CH2 also. Are we okay with this? And you can put a little bond between a CH2 and a C right there if you need to visualize it like that. Okie dokie, smokies. Okay, so are we okay with, we just figured out what our product is, so we can do the next step. Okay, now up here, it says to get to the carboxylic acid, we need a primary alcohol and some kind of oxidizing agent. If we go from a primary alcohol to a carboxylic acid, are we changing the number of carbons? No, so let's start there. Let's go ahead and do this. And let's figure out what's on the end there. Okay. So, what do I have also on that carbon all the way to the right of my red molecule that's not there? That I need to draw in. And don't worry about getting it perfect, folks. We're just doing it step by step. Oh. OH, yes. And OH. Okay. Now, is that carbon complete, or do we need something else then? Another H, so can I put a two there? Yes, okay. So this carbon right here is bonded to only one other carbon. So this carbon right here is what kind of carbon? The primary carbon have an OH bonded to a primary carbon, so what kind of alcohol is this? It's a primary alcohol. Now you can draw this a different way if you choose to do so. We could take the OH off of here and we could set it right here. It's exactly the same thing. So we know that we can draw this molecule a bazillion different ways, right folks? Yeah. Okay, I could take it and put the OH down. I could take this whole thing and draw it backwards. Are we okay with that? All right, so I've got my primary alcohol here. Now I need an oxidizing agent. And this is probably where we might not remember uh, what our oxidizing agents are, but if I put a couple on here for you folks, you're probably like, oh, I've seen that. Which one did we use in lab? Does anybody remember? Yes, it was something with dichromate. And that's okay, if we don't remember, we'll just go ahead and we'll put them both, okay? 
So we've got potassium dichromate, or we can do sodium dichromate. And remember, potassiums and sodiums work the same way. So if in one molecule you needed two potassiums, in um, a corresponding sodium-containing compound, you're going to need two sodiums because they're both plus one. So potassium or sodium dichromate, we could also use potassium permanganate. So that was the purple compound that when it oxidizes something else, because it's an oxidant, it's an oxidizing agent, it goes from purple to that brown poopy color. Do you guys remember doing that one? Okay, so what atom do you notice we have a lot of in our oxidizing compounds? Oxygen. Are we okay with that? Do you guys, do you guys remember seeing these? The dichromates are the ones that went orange to green. The potassium permanganate is the one that went purple to poop brown. Are we, are we recalling this from lab? Yes, you did this, okay. All right, and even if you didn't remember those formulas, you have to at least remember me saying it at some point and drawing it at some point in lecture, right? Yeah, okay. Um, any problem with this, folks? So not only did we do one method, we did two methods, and we did extra credit, we did a third method, okay? Good? Bad? Ugly? Well, it's chemistry, so it's always ugly, right? <laughs> yes. At least you don't do math in this in this class, right? No answer. Okay. All right. Esters. These are my favorite. They smell good. Okay. What's different about an ester? The ester, instead of having a hydrogen right there, it's has an R group. And the R group can be the same or different from this one on this side. So we have the little prime mark right there. So we have R and R prime. But again, they can be the same or different. Now, um, an example of this is methyl acetate. Now, whatever is on the carboxylate oxygen right here comes at the beginning of the name and we put a space there. So let me color code that. And don't worry, we'll do slides of naming. So right here, we have methyl, and then we have space, and we have acetate. Are we okay with that? Okay. And the acetate portion of it, that's common nomenclature. And if you have a seat, that's telling you you have two carbons. Remember the form, like with formaldehyde, that's telling you you have one carbon. So common nomenclature is a little bit different from IUPAC. So in IUPAC, whenever you have one carbon, it's meth. And whenever you have two carbons, it's eth. Are we putting this together, folks? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in uh, both of them, when you have three carbons, it's pro, but one's propan and the other one's propion. Does that sound familiar? Okay. All right, now we can have um, esters that are cyclic, and right down here, we can see that this cyclic ester here is called a lactone. So what we have is a carbonyl group, and we have O and R, and the R group that's over here and the R group that's here, they just happen to be connected to each other in the back right there. And of course, that's gonna make us go, ah, because it's a cyclic structure there. But can we see how that's an ester? Okay, so that specific one is called a lactone. Which is weird because, um, we're like, no, that must be a carbon, not a ketone. And you can kind of see that carbonyl Carbon kind of makes it look like a ketone, but it's an ester. Anyways, moving on. What we did in lab, you guys did this. You made isoamyl acetate, otherwise known as what? Banana oil. Banana oil. 
and it smelled really lovely. And then all of a sudden it would smell like vinegar and then it would go back to smelling lovely and then it would smell like vinegar a little bit. And it's because you have that double headed arrow right there and it's indicating that there's still gonna be some reactant left over. So we were smelling some of the vinegar, which is the acetic acid right here along with our banana oil right there. And if we took the experiment further, we could get rid of the acetic acid, but we only had so much time, so we stopped there. Any questions for me on this, folks? Okay, so in this reaction, we took an alcohol, and a carboxylic acid, And we used an acid catalyst, and that gave us an ester. And then we went, hmm, stuff smells good. Okie dokie, smokies. Okay. We also did this one right here. We made methyl salicylate, which was oil of wintergreen. So right here, this one is our carboxylic acid. And that one right there, CH3OH is what? What kind of compound is that? That's an alcohol right there. So we've got our alcohol. And then we have H2SO4, which is your wet. That's your acid catalyst. And you made a wet. An ester. So are we following the formula here? We sure are. And there was uh, some there was a, some drawings on the slide before we got to it. And I think that was from last semester where I was showing the class that these two things are the same thing. They're just drawn a little bit differently. So what we did is we took this one and we just flipped it around. So you see how no bonds are broken or made. And molecules, they flip around in your beaker or your flask all the time. So if you're not breaking any bonds or making any bonds, and you're getting the same thing, it is the same molecule. So can we see how these two things are the same? Kind of, sort of, maybe? Okay. Questions for me, folks? Okay. Moving on. Some other lovely esters right here. We have ethyl butanoate. So if we take a look at this, folks, you can see the CH2, CH3 right there. So you got two carbons, so that's the ethyl portion of it. You all right with that? Okay. And then the butan part is telling us that we've got four carbons. And that's going to be over here, okay? So your butanoate. And that we can isolate from mangoes or mangoes, however you would like to say it. And pencil butanoate, um, that gives us the peachy smell. Now the pencil portion right here of the name is telling us on the carboxylate oxygen, you're gonna have an R group that has how many carbons? And you can count them if you don't remember it. One, two, three, four, five, okay? So, this R group over here is actually bigger than this side, but that's okay. We still name it the same way. And we have butanoate over here telling us that this side of it has four carbons. Okay? I guess it's apricots instead of peaches. But anyways, they smell good. Okay. We should have more ester lots, right? We make the smell of peaches along with banana. Or you guys just get to pick the ester that you made. You don't like the smell? Oh, you just like the smell. You don't like to make it? Okay. Okay, so 
let's take a look at some physical properties here. Come on, go away. There we go. Okay. So, with our esters, we have higher boiling points than um, alkenes because we got oxygens here. So we have electronegative atoms. And if you have electronegative atoms, you can do what kind of bonding or interaction? A little less than hydrogen bonding. Yeah, dipole-dipole. Because they're electronegative, they're hugging the electrons, they're pulling the electrons towards themselves, which makes themselves partially negative. And whatever is on the other end of the bond is partially what? Positive. So you've got some dipoles in here. So you can do dipole-dipole interactions with another ester. But you don't have any hydrogen bonding going on here. But because you don't have a hydrogen on an electronegative atom, you have a bunch of hydrogens on the carbons over there. But do hydrogens on carbons participate in hydrogen bonding? No. Okay. It's a hydrogen that's on a very electronegative atom that does that. You don't have any hydrogens on your oxygens here. So you get a higher boiling point than a regular old alkene because of the dipole-dipole bonding, but you don't get a boiling point as high as something that's doing hydrogen bonding, like an alcohol or a carboxylic acid. So the carboxylic acid, they had two oxygens also, but one of their oxygens had a hydrogen on it, okay? You guys remember that? Are we all right with that? Okay, so kind of in between, because we've got the dipole-dipole bonds, okay? So esters cannot form hydrogen bonds with other esters. They can hydrogen bond with a different kind of molecule if the other molecule has a hydrogen that's bonded to an electronegative atom. So that hydrogen right there could do hydrogen bonding with this, but we're talking about if you have a pot full of just ester, just esters, they, they can't hydrogen bond to each other. And the other way we say that in chemistry is they won't hydrogen bond to themselves, which sounds like you're trying to bond to yourself, but it doesn't mean that, it just means you can't hydrogen bond to another molecule that's exactly the same as you. Does that make sense, folks? So do you see that written somewhere? That's just one of those weird things, okay? Alright, moving on to the next slide, right here. It's going to show us exactly what we just talked about, but in picture format and in a different way, just in case you tune me out and you're like, this is the most boring shit ever, right? No answer. Okay, alright, more with this stuff. We've got our ester right here, and we've got what kind of molecule over there, folks? What is that? That's not an alcohol. It doesn't have an OH on it. So it kind of looks like an alcohol, but it's the other one we were talking about today. Yes, carboxylic acid over here. Okay, so notice lower boiling point, higher boiling point over here. This one has a hydrogen bonded to an electronegative atom. So we're going to be able to do the hydrogen bonding here. Over here, we don't have a hydrogen on one of our oxygens, so we can't do hydrogen bonding with other esters here. But we do have dipole-dipole interactions available. And just in case you forgot what that looks like, because the carbon and the oxygen in that molecule right there have very different electronegativity, what we get is a partial negative on our oxygen and a partial positive on our carbon. And the other way you folks can draw that is with a dipole moment. You don't do both, though. You do one or the other. You can draw the arrow or you can draw the little delta symbols. Do you folks remember that kind of sort of maybe? Okay. So another one of these comes along and it switches its orientation. So the partial positive lines up with the partial negative of a different molecule, and the partial negative up there lines up. That is a big old negative symbol there. <laughs> I got crazy. Lines up with the partial positive, okay? But no hydrogen bonding. So lower boiling point, higher boiling point over there. Are we all right with that, folks? Okay. So again, with the um, dimer, or the carboxylic acid, in case you didn't like my picture from before, 
our carboxylic acids, they can form dimers, which means they've got two points of hydrogen bonding, which again causes that very large boiling point. Does that make it clear if I write all of everything down that I just said? Are we, are we okay with this, folks? If dipole dipole bonding, hydrogen bonding, why esters would have lower boiling points than carboxylic acids? Why on earth carboxylic acids have such high boiling points? Okay, great. Questions for me? Every year, my daughter, she's like, we have to get my costume on. I'm like, okay, you just tell, tell me when. She tells me and she tells me and then she waits till the last minute and nobody has what she wants and she gets all upset. I'm like, oh, you are 13. How do you not learn by now? <laughs> like, you know, we need to like, so I've been telling her, you better tell me now. We better order on Amazon now or it's gonna be, are you gonna be wearing what you wore last year? Which is what you wore the year before. Anyways, what's up? Oh, she has had to do that because, yeah. But usually, she likes to dress up, so she'll do a bunch of chores, so um, she has money to buy her costume, but then she doesn't. I don't know, anyway. Um, fun stuff. My son was a, a, a big poop emoji two years in a row. Have you guys seen that costume? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, you're such a boy. What? Poop emoji? The big poop emoji? Mm -hmm. Yes. Number two. Okay, so uh, another slide that looks very much like this other slide over here, folks. This one right here. The first one we were talking about boiling points, and this one right here we're talking about solubility in water. And um, we can see that our esters are kind of in between uh, the solubility in water of alkenes and alcohol. Oops, I'm sorry, that is not true. They are more soluble in water than alcohols. Whew, okay, that must mean I need some more caffeine. Okay, so esters, why are they more soluble in water than alcohols and not following the trend? Well, esters cannot hydrogen bond to other esters, but they can hydrogen bond to water because water has a hydrogen that's on an electronegative atom, so water can act as the hydrogen donor. So it has the hydrogen and can do the hydrogen bonding. So water right here, we've got the hydrogen right here that's bonded to the very electronegative atom that makes it very attractive to our oxygen and they're like, hello. And the hydrogen in the water is like, hello. So you get a lot of that happening. And so the water is like, hello. And it pulls it in and it surrounds it doing all these hydrogen bonds and that's called um, dissolving it or solubilizing. So it says, low molecular weight esters have significant solubility in water, which begs the question, what about high molecular weight esters? And all that means is that you would add a big R chain to make it a higher weight. Now what's the problem when you add a big old R chain onto your ester? 
like say we had like a 20 carbon chain. The R chain is polar or nonpolar? Nonpolar. And does water like nonpolar things? No. So the water is going to be like, ah, Esther, I like you, but I don't know, that big old R chain. I no, no, it's going to be a no for me, Ghost Rider. Okay, so the lower molecular weight esters, they tend to be soluble in water, and the higher molecular weight esters that you're adding a big old R chain to, they tend to be less soluble in water because of the whole polar, nonpolar thing. Are we all right with that, folks? Yay! Okay, uh, questions for me? Now we get to naming esters. Aren't you guys excited about this? Yeah. Woohoo! Okay, we do what we usually do. We um, go ahead and we go, okay, what's our functional group here? And we're in the ester section, so we're probably going to see the ester functional group. And then we're going to want to identify the longest continuous carbon chain that includes that carbonyl group, the carbon double bond oxygen. And then we're going to go, oh, there's something in green up there. And I kind of remember that the R group on the other side of the carboxylate oxygen, that's the one that has a single bond. I think it comes first in the name. I think she mentioned that somewhere. So we're going to have to put all this together. And yes, what you guys want to do is you want to build this as an ester. So I've got to look over here and identify what that is in my specific ester. And if we pop on down to here, you can see this one right here has two carbons. So that's going to be called what, folks? Ethyl. And look, in common nomenclature and in IUPAC nomenclature, it's both ethyl. Yay! Right, folks? Not only is it both ethyl, it's ethyl space. of it, like acetic acid or acetone, is telling us that we've got two carbons over here, right? Mm -hmm. Is this sounding familiar? Yeah. Even if like you couldn't just like do it for me right now, at least you remember me saying this at some point. Okay, and instead of acetone or acetic acid, you have this eight over here. So it's ethyl acetate. And for a UPAC, we have ethyl and then over on this side, we have two carbons. So it should make sense that we have F and right there. Are you guys okay with that? Okay. And since we haven't learned how to name esters yet, you can see now that in a UPAC, the ending for an ester is going to be O8. So in common nomenclature, it's 8. And in a uh, UPAC, it's O8. And that brings us back up here to the rules. So number two. Um, after we did number one and we identified the R prime, it said ethyl, and then we added a space. And then it says, identify the carboxylic acid portion of the molecule, which means this part over here without the hydrogen, okay? That's the parent part of it, okay? And change the ic acid, so carboxylic acid, to eight for common naming, not naming, it should be naming and O8 for IUPAC. And when we did that, we said acetate and FNO8. If we had this like this, and there was a hydrogen here, for IUPAC, it would be, F I, had on, I need another hand. 
ethanoic acid. And if it was common nomenclature, it would be acetic acid. So we're taking the ic acid off the end and putting for common the H and for a UPAC OH. Okie dokie, Smokey. Mm -hmm. going to be a space because it works that way in both common nomenclature and on the path. Now for the other side of the molecule in the rules page called that the carboxylic acid part of the molecule just because it was trying to say it looks like a carboxylic acid but you know. How many carbons do we have there? Three. One, two, three. So for a UPAC it's going to be Propan, and for common, it's going to be, does anyone remember? Propion. Do we kind of sort of remember learning that for the carboxylic acids? Okay, so we, I gave you a whole chart, and I'll write down the chart next time we meet again for our esters, but just because we're running out of time, I wanted to get started on this one. Okay, so for common nomenclature, we've got ethyl, propion, and what's going to be the ending, folks? And for a UPAC, it's going to be propen OE. Yes. So not too bad. And can we see how we've learned this stuff all the way along in the semester? And how at first you're like, what, why, why? And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, it repeats. Ah, ha, 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 right? No. Okay. All righty then. So we accomplished this one, no problem. All right, so let's go on to the next one. So we want to go ahead and do this side first. And let's just do common and our UPAC all together. Okay, so for both common and our UPAC, what's going to be the first part of my name? Good, Michael. Is everybody okay with that part of it? Yes. Anybody need, need to explain that part of it? Okay. So the next part of it is that we're going to need to take a look at the carboxylic acid portion of the molecule, specifically how many carbons we have right there in order to figure out what that second part of the name is. Now there's two carbons here, so it might be easier to do IUPAC because when there's two carbons, you're going to start the name with what? Ethan. Does that make sense? Two carbons is some kind of eth or ethan? Okay. So we've got ethan, and for a UPAC, what's the ending for esters? Oh, wait. Are we okay with that part, folks? Yes, no, maybe so? Okay. Now we gotta back up and do um, common. So we already did methyl, and now we need to do the other side of it. When you have two carbons for common nomenclature, it's not ethan, it's what? Yes, good, it's a C. And it's an ester, so it's not acetic acid or acetone, it's acetate, good. 
we kind of getting the hang of this? Yay! Okay, so the next one is a little bit odd because it's drawn backwards from what we're used to. So on this one and this one, um, the carboxylate oxygen was right here, and then we had the R prime group this way. This one is drawn backwards. So we have the carboxylate oxygen here, and the R prime is over here. Plus, it's a cyclic structure, so you're probably like, oh, I can't do that. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. If it was a straight chain and it had five carbons, you'd say, no problem, that's a pencil. It's got five carbons and it's a cyclic structure, so it's called what? Cyclopentyl. Are you guys okay with that? So instead of pentyl, it's cyclopentyl. So we've got cyclopentyl. And then we look on the other side. So right here, I did this. And then let's switch this up and do this over here. We've got one, two, three carbons. And it's drawn kind of weird like this, but it's the same as this, folks. It's just drawn weird, so it, it can attempt to confuse you, okay? But it's the same as this over here. Do you guys see it? Okay, so it's drawn upside down, and instead of doing this, it's like wee, like that. So if you just turn it over, it's the same thing over there. So we're going to have, oh, no, it's not, because it has a branch there, and nobody screamed at me. Okay, so I didn't see that because I didn't have my glasses on. You're going to tell me, put your glasses on, lady. You missed the thing. Okay, so we've got this little guy here. Okay, so that's an interesting quirk in this problem, right, folks? And that means we're going to have this part right here. Let's see what I can do. Propanoate and propionate on that one. But it's got a branch, so we'll leave it. Okay. 
Any questions for me? Okay, on the common nomenclature, like the first two right there, um, they're easy enough for you guys to do. The third one right there, no, but yes, on a new path. Uh, before we finish, because it is exactly 2.10, um, last chance, questions? Concerns? Complaints? I will try to upload this as soon as I can, but it is a Wednesday lecture and we know how that goes. Um, feel free to email me, where is it, where is it? And I'll send you little screenshots of it's at 66% still for the last 42 hours, okay? Um, yeah, all right, some of you guys, I'll see you in lab. Some of you, I will see you on Monday. Bye.